Welcome to Commentaries in Hair Loss. I'm Dr. Jeff Donovan. I hope you'll join me as we explore some important questions from the field of hair loss. Today we'll take a look at the question, what are the potential problems with a shallow scalp biopsy? A scalp biopsy is normally four millimeters in diameter. We call this a four millimeter punch, but the depth of the biopsy is dependent a little bit on the physician performing the biopsy. Normally a biopsy should be performed into the subcutaneous fat, which generally translates into a biopsy about four to seven millimeters in depth. There are many reasons why one might not quite go deep, such as four millimeters to seven millimeters in depth. Sometimes we're worried about underlying vascular structures and blood vessels. Sometimes we're worried about the scar that we might create. Sometimes we're worried about um, damaging underlying structures if we haven't performed many biopsies in a particular area. And on account of this fear, we don't go deep enough. And the result is a shallow biopsy that makes its way only into the upper dermis. And so today we'll take a look at what are the implications when a biopsy is too shallow. So here we're looking at a four millimeter punch biopsy that's just come out of the scalp. What you'll notice here is that the biopsy extends deeper below the bulb or the lower portion of the hair follicle. The lower portion is mainly fat and this is the subcutaneous fat and it's important to sample this area. It's important that the biopsy goes deep enough so that this portion can be removed in the biopsy specimen and sent to the pathologist. What we'll learn today is that there's a lot of valuable information that lies in the lower portion of the hair follicle, in the bulbs, and sometimes in the subcutaneous fat. And ideally, this should be submitted to the pathologist. Here's another example of a four millimeter punch biopsy that's being removed from the scalp. The term four millimeter refers to the diameter of the punch and these are disposable tools that physicians buy and they are circular punches and they allow this sort of a specimen to be removed from the scalp. Physicians can buy two millimeter, three millimeter, four millimeter, five millimeter, six millimeter, all the way up to ten millimeter punches and four millimeters is the standard diameter punch that we should be using when performing scalp biopsies because these are the standard measurements and references that pathologists will use. As you can see in this particular photograph that the diameter is four millimeters but the biopsy extends deeper than this. This biopsy is almost seven millimeters in depth. And the important point I'd like to make is that it extends below the level of the bulbs. So does performing a scalp biopsy that's too shallow really make a difference? Well, what I'd like to point out today is that sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And so what this translates into is that sometimes we require a patient to have another biopsy and sometimes we don't. Generally speaking, a biopsy should be performed into the subcutaneous fat and should be five, six, seven millimeters in depth. Depends a little bit on the area being biopsied, the amount of fat there. The ability to diagnose hair loss from a scalp biopsy is dependent on proper technique, but it's also dependent on the pathologist who's reading the biopsy and a pathologist who is very experienced in reading biopsies can often gather a large amount of information from the biopsy. 
And in some cases, it becomes less important that the biopsy was performed deep enough. Let's take a look at this example first. This is a cartoon example of alopecia areata. This is an autoimmune disease. And on the left, you can see four hair follicles. You can see the yellow sebaceous glands at the top. And you can see inflammation in purple color at the bottom of the bulbs. This is the classic swarm of bees of lymphocytic inflammation that's present in alopecia areata. And certainly pathologists, when they're diagnosing alopecia areata in the acute stage, like to see this swarm of bees inflammation at the bottom of the biopsy. There are other clues to the diagnosis of alopecia areata. And so even without this swarm of bees, sometimes we can get a clue about the diagnosis of alopecia areata, including an increased proportion of catagen and telogen hairs, eosinophils in the tracks that are left behind when the hair falls out. So there are, there are other ways of diagnosing alopecia areata besides relying on this swarm of bees appearance. But if we take a look at what happens in cases where the biopsy is performed too shallow, we can immediately see that we miss the ability to identify this swarm of bees of lymphocytes at the bottom of the hair follicle, and that's shown in the diagram on the right side. We still see that the sebaceous glands in yellow are present and so the pathologist has a clear indication that this is a non-scarring alopecia. We still see the hairs and so a pathologist may be able to identify that there's an increased number of catagen and telogen hairs which may be a tip-off to suggest that uh, we could be dealing with a diagnosis of alopecia areata. But this important piece of information is missed regarding the swarm of bees of lymphocytes at the bottom. And so in some cases we could potentially misdiagnose alopecia areata if a biopsy is performed too shallow. Let's take a look at another example of dissecting cellulitis. Dissecting cellulitis is a scarring alopecia. It's a less common scarring alopecia, often affects black and Hispanic men 20 to 40 years of age and they present with itching and burning and discharge of pus on the scalp. The inflammation that's present initially in dissecting cellulitis is quite deep. It's way down in the lower dermis and subcutaneous area and in fact, in the earliest stages of dissecting cellulitis, when the disease first appears, the upper regions of the hair follicle are relatively unaffected. Certainly the sebaceous glands may still be present in the earliest, earliest stages. The stem cells are not affected in the earliest stages. And on account of this, if we can properly diagnose dissecting cellulitis at the earliest stages, and shut off this inflammation, we can often grow back hair, even though it's classified as a scarring alopecia. This is because the inflammation is so deep that it leaves the key stem cells alone. So here we have a cartoon on the left of two hair follicles. We see the sebaceous glands in yellow. I've shown one sebaceous gland structure here, just indicating that we've lost some sebaceous glands, that we have a scarring alopecia. And the inflammation in this cartoon is shown quite deep. And so you can appreciate in this particular slide that if a biopsy is performed too shallow, we miss all the inflammation in the lower part of the biopsy and it makes the diagnosis of dissecting cellulitis more difficult. Again, there are uh, other features that can sometimes be present in a biopsy that can allow a very astute pathologist to offer some recommendations to the physician who's performed the biopsy. But in these particular cases, the alopecia areata in the slide before and here in dissecting cellulitis,
when these key pieces of information are absent, it becomes much more difficult to diagnose based on biopsy, and we potentially miss a diagnosis. Moving on, let's take a look at diagnosing lichen planopilaris, which is a scarring alopecia. Here on the left, we have a cartoon of lichen planopilaris. We have two hair follicles. You'll notice that the sebaceous glands are reduced. We have one yellow dot on the uh, left-hand side. So we have somewhat reduced sebaceous glands, which is key in these scarring alopecias, a very classical histological finding. You'll notice in lichen planopilaris, the inflammation is in the upper part of the hair follicle, and that's shown with these purple pink dots. This is lymphocytic inflammation consisting largely of lymphocytes, as well as plasma cells and other inflammatory cells as well. The blue is some perifollicular fibrosis. Perifollicular fibrosis is, of course, part of the scarring process that occurs, but it's not diagnostic of lichen planopilaris. We can see perifollicular fibrosis sometimes even in androgenetic alopecia. But what are the implications here of a biopsy that's performed too shallow? Well, as you can see on the cartoon on the right, we are able to see this lymphocytic inflammation. We're able to appreciate that the oil glands are reduced. The sebaceous glands are reduced. We're able to see the perifollicular fibrosis. We're able to see a reduction in terminal hair follicle units. And so an astute pathologist will comment that the biopsy is shallow, but the pathologist will comment that sebaceous glands are absent. There's lymphocytic inflammation in the upper part of the hair follicle, which we call the isthmus. The pathologist will comment on the presence of perifollicular fibrosis. The pathologist might comment on other things as well, including a certain pattern of lymphocytic inflammation around the hair follicle, which we call lichenoid inflam inflammation, which involves destruction of the outer root sheath keratinocytes. And so an astute pathologist will say, we have a shallow biopsy, it is suboptimal, but we're seeing the typical features of lichen planopilaris, and uh, a pathologist will often make a comment such as, if the diagnosis of scarring alopecia is being considered in this patient, uh, lichen planopilaris may be among the entities. And so in this particular case, a shallow biopsy is not ideal, but a shallow biopsy still allows the diagnosis to be rendered and in a patient presenting with a biopsy report with a shallow biopsy and all these features present, we know that the diagnosis is like in plano pilaris and there's no need to re-biopsy. And finally, let's take a look at one final example of a shallow biopsy. In this case, we'll discuss the implications of a shallow biopsy in androgenetic alopecia or male and female balding. On the left, we have four hair follicle units. Some are thick, such as the one in the middle, second from the left. Some are much thinner, some are not as deep into the dermis or the lower part of the biopsy specimen. So this variation in follicle size, variation in caliber, it's very typical of androgenetic alopecia. We see the oil glands in yellow are present, and so this reminds us that we're dealing with a non-scarring alopecia. And so the presence of hair follicles of different calibers, the presence of the sebaceous glands really is the tip-off here that uh, we have androgenetic alopecia. So what are the implications of a biopsy that's performed too shallow? <clears throat> well, on the right-hand side, we see a biopsy that extends only into the upper dermis. However, we see these hair follicles of different caliber. We see the sebaceous glands are present. Uh, and so even though we don't see the bulbs and we don't see the lower portion of the hair follicle, an astute pathologist will comment on the variation in the caliber of the follicles, which we call anisotrichosis. Uh, 
uh, we see the presence of the sebaceous glands and so the pathologist will comment on the uh, likelihood of this being um, androgenetic alopecia. Now an astute pathologist can also determine that there are a reasonably normal number of catagen and telogen and antigen hair follicles and so can comment on whether histologically we have evidence of a telogen effluvium as well. In this particular biopsy that's performed too shallow, we can't comment on the bulbs, we can't comment on inflammation deep down, we can't comment on um, whether the swarm of bees is present in uh, alopecia areata, but there's enough information here that a pathologist can comment on the caliber of the hair follicles and the presence of sebaceous glands. And so an astute pathologist can get a pretty good idea that this is pretty unlikely to be uh, alopecia areata. We have a normal number of catagen and telogen follicles. This is unlikely to be trichotillomania. We're not seeing the pigment casts and the other features that we see when patients pull out their own hair. This is not a scarring alopecia because the oil glands are present in this biopsy. And so even though we don't have an optimal biopsy, we have enough information here which tips us off that we're dealing with androgenetic alopecia. And so when this particular biopsy report comes in to me, um, and I'm about to go in and see this patient, I don't need to re-biopsy. Uh, I'm pretty confident that the biopsy they've had before uh, is is reasonably adequate and unless I have reason to believe that their diagnosis might be something else uh, I'm not going to perform a new biopsy in this particular patient. So with that we will conclude there are certainly some potential problems with performing biopsies that are not deep enough and I certainly encourage physicians to perform biopsies that go right into the subcutaneous fat with a four millimeter punch tool. It is important to choose carefully the region of the scalp where you're going to biopsy to put in some lidocaine with epinephrine, which is the medication we use to freeze or anesthetize the scalp and wait five or 10 minutes or 15 minutes if you can and perform a biopsy that's deep enough. And when you push the punch tool into the scalp and you're about to remove the specimen, if you feel that I don't think I went deep enough, then push the punch tool deeper into the scalp and remove a deeper specimen. This can have great importance sometimes in diagnosing some rare and atypical conditions, uh, some subtle conditions. And so if you're going to pick up an early, early case of dissecting cellulitis, it's wonderful to have a deep biopsy. If you're going to capture a subtle uh, an early case of alopecia areata you're not sure about, it's, it's great to have a deep biopsy to, to identify the inflammation that's deep down around the bulbs.